Hi, I'm Femi OK, and you're in the stream today. This is your brain on sports. It's a new book which looks at the way that both fans and athletes behave and see if there's a deep psychological meaning to it. Let's just check in with Malika Vlao, our digital producer, who's been finding out an awful lot about sports and our online community too. So much about both of them. So what better way to explain this than with an example okay. that our community actually shared with us. So India and Pakistan have a long-standing rivalry in the game of cricket. And we tweeted out to our community during a big match this weekend they played in which India won. And this is what we got. This tweet says, Pakistan fans watching the match like this. You see a person throwing something at the TV in anger. What might account for such strong feelings? Well, we got an answer in this next tweet. This is Rohit who says this is about rivalry. It goes beyond boundaries and into the hearts and minds of millions of people on either side of the border. So for those of you watching, wherever you are, we want to hear stories just like this. So tweet them to us with hashtag AJStream. My name is Till Montgomery, ex track and field athlete, and I'm in the stream. Sports can trigger emotions and behavior that's sometimes hard to explain. Why do fans and athletes buy into superstitions and rituals that have no clear influence over the outcome of a match? Why in the heat of the moment would a player verbally abuse an umpire or headbutt an opponent in front of millions of fans? These are some of the questions explored in This Is Your Brain on Sports. It's a new book which links the behavior of teams and athletes and fans to society at large. So what can sport actually teach us about human nature? To help us talk about this, we're joined by Sam Summers. He's the co-author of This Is Your Brain on Sports. He's also an associate professor of psychology at Tufts University in Boston. John Amici is a former professional basketball player who's now a trained psychologist. He joins us from London. Thomas van Schaik is a sport marketeer who's currently the commercial director of the Dutch Olympic Committee. He's in Amsterdam and in Boston we're joined by superfan Abba Galavelli whose favorite teams are the Indian cricket team and the Boston Celtics. So good to have you here everybody, really good to see you. I am going to show you a little clip Sam, you can tell me what's going on with this fan. So uh, let me just take you back a few years. River Plate, which is one of the biggest teams in Argentina, playing a game is a game that they end up being relegated from and this is what happened have a look to see I, I've learned a lot of Spanish curse words by watching this clip Sam what is going on when somebody is watching and they're so agitated that they're yelling things at the TV screen. Psychologically, what's happening? Sports are this uh, unbelievably, uh, we're unbelievably passionate about it. Sports are treated in, in many circles the way that other cultural or even religious affiliations are by people, especially when we're talking uh, about, well, international sporting events, or for that matter, uh, the passionate team you've been rooting for since you were a child. We we take a lot of uh, vicarious pleasure and pain from these sporting events. It's what we tried to do in the book was talk a little bit about uh, what this what what this whole uh, world of being a sports fan, or for that matter, a player or a coach, tells us about human nature more generally. Your example to start things off tells yeah. us that. These identities of sports fans are unbelievably central to our, our sense of, of self. So let me just check in with Abba. Abba, in terms of your being a super fan, what is the most, would you say, uh, irrational thing that you've ever done? Irrationally, I don't know. I personally am someone who is less likely to scream at the television and more likely to sort of curse in my own, sort of to myself and put my head in my hands. But I'm definitely around a lot of people who are, you know, throwing things kind of like you said at the TV. They might jump up. They might leave the room um, because they can't handle the anxiety, even though they're not even close to the field geographically. And I think that's really interesting to talk about, about how um, they sort of just leave the entire space, despite how big of a fan they might be of the team. Well, Thomas, aside from irrationality, there's another trait that some people online are saying fans often display, and that is a 
undying sense of loyalty. So this is the tweet we got from Hamedi, who says, would you leave your family because they weren't doing well financially? Teams are like a family to many fans. Another person, keeping on that family uh, theme here, INS says, I've supported one team for way too long. It's Arsenal. And Arsenal is my homophobic racist uncle on WhatsApp. And so he's, he's likening nice. this. <laughs> he's likening this, this football team to an uncle that you love but don't always agree with and are, are often disappointed in. Can you relate to those feelings of intense loyalty? Well, I think the clip is from a gentleman called uh, El Puteador. <laughs> and uh, it's a clear case of disinhibition where you basically lose yourself in your, uh, in your emotions. Now, this gentleman uh, is clearly losing himself in, in the emotions of the game. Whereas uh, I think he's a lovely grandfather and a great father, but as he's watching the game, he completely loses himself and his emotions. And uh, when we talk about fans, and, uh, and that comes from the Latin fanaticus, which means uh, as much as uh, insanely but divinely inspired. And the heart has reasons that the mind doesn't really understand, unless it's a, a trained psychologist like we have on the, on, on the show today. So I'm hoping that he will be able to understand where this uh, massive obsession of, that people have with sports actually actually comes from. John, can you weigh in here? Because you know, not only were you a top athlete, but you're now a psychologist as well. So how do you make the connection between those two things? I mean, I, I think um, you, you have to look at sports and realize that for many people, they find their lives rather constricting. They see um, that the rules that exist don't always allow their uh, more base passions room to breathe and and around sports we've created a context where behaviors that we do not normally encourage or even sometimes accept within wider society yeah. are somehow acceptable give us an where, example <clears throat> well behaviors that you would be would be generally frowned upon i mean some of the some of the chants that you would hear in in football stadiums around the world ah. Um, to put off your opponents are uh -huh. less than savory oftentimes. But the, the interesting part is it, often people think, oh, fans of football must be terrible people. And it's the context. Within that arena, they behave in a certain way. But the moment they leave the arena, uh. you will find that they will find those very same things they were doing just an hour before completely unacceptable if they hear it from somebody else or if someone in their family does it. So it, it, sport allows this this context where they get to be disinhibited for sure and where they get to really um let loose with their baser emotions probably john am i yeah, think it's a go ahead please no, go, go ahead well it's a, a there's a, a case of de-individualization where uh, when people when they are in a group exhibit behavior like uh, the football fans that you were just discussing where they feel this is somehow uh, uh safe because they are hidden uh, within the context of a group of people mm -hmm. and they they exhibit all kinds of behavior and it's quite interesting how, how football teams actually try to re-individualize fans like uh, with the use of mirrors or camera footage or you know, how, they, how they play psychological games with the fans that are actually about to misbehave in their stadiums. I think it's a very interesting phenomenon. You know, what's uh, even more interesting is that you're, we're talking about context and this happening in certain contexts, but uh, there's one video commenter, Sam, who says, that might be true, but it also goes across the board for any sport there is. So this is Matt. He has a question for you. Hey, Sam, congrats on the book. Uh, something you and I have in common is our fascination with um, the, the weirdness of people's behavior around sports. Something that's always caught my attention is how people can be irrational regardless of the stakes. You know, people are equally irrational about a youth sports game as they are about something like the Super Bowl. In your research, did you come across any boundary conditions for people's irrational behavior in sports? So, Sam, can you explain boundary conditions? And, and is there a difference between being riled up at the Super Bowl and a Little League game? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think what Matt is asking about are, you know, is it only these high stakes, winner takes all, World Cup finals, Super Bowls, World Series? I mean, is that what it takes to, to ratchet things up? And, and sure, people are more riled up by the World Cup finals than they are on average your, your run-of-the-mill league game in a, in a, uh, in a first-tier uh, football match in a football league. But it, it's, it's the case that when you get the competitive juices boiling, when you get to, when there's competition on the line, when teams are pitted against one another, it does have this, this 
potential to bring out different emotions and different tendencies in us. And as Matt suggests, anyone who spent any time in the youth sports world, coaching uh, as an administrator, just as a parent, has seen that sometimes e e the adults <gasps> are not doing what, what they're supposed yeah. to be doing. Parents are terrible. Abba, what did you want to add? I can see you nodding as Sam is talking. I was going to say it also depends on the relation and connection that you feel with the individual athletes. So on one hand, obviously, the stakes are high in a big World Cup game. But on the other hand, you know, if you're an overzealous soccer mom, you might just feel a closer tie to the athlete that's actually playing the game and knowing what they're, how they're going to feel at the end of it. Um, and that might drive your emotions the other way, that way, too. Let me just move on a little bit because I want to focus on the athletes. And sometimes athletes do incredible things at the point where... It's really, really critical. So I'm, I'm thinking back to 2006 when Zinedine Zidane was playing in the World Cup. He headbutted a member of the other team. I'm sure I don't really need to remind you what happened there. Sam, so critical. That was the last time he played on that last level. Time. The last time. And that's what we... You know what, I remember a lot more about Zinedine Zidane, but that it was pretty critical. He, sure, and he's an, he's an international icon. He's a, he's a national hero. I mean, this is a guy who's a team leader, and all of a sudden he's, you know, he, he's headbutted the Italian defender. It, it's, we will do things in the heat of passion, uh, and in different kinds of passion, competitive arousal, but other kinds of arousal, that we would not do in a cold, rational state. Uh, there are time and time again examples of this in sports. It's not to exonerate the behavior. I mean, France needed him to not do that. I'm not trying to justify it. Yeah. But it is, it is different. We behave and think and make different kinds of decisions when we are under physiological arousal. Our brain is functioning with more of a fight-or-flight kind of basis and not the, the rational selves that we like to think ourselves to be otherwise. John, do you buy that? Well, it, it is absolutely true. I mean, he's, Sam's absolutely right. If you are at the very height of arousal, which is what happens when you're playing, your muscles are fully activated, you, every, every neurochemical uh, in your body is surging, um, and you often feel the stress and pressure of the moment, then you're going to behave sometimes in unpredictable ways. It is worth noting that in this particular case, this man is known as been, he had, was known his entire career as being yeah. reasonably volatile. So <laughs> this is not, well, I'm not, I'm not trying to say this is in character for him, yeah. but certainly you can see how at the very limits of his ability to moderate his own behavior, right. this is not an unlikely outcome. Uh -huh. Well, I think, I think it's also interesting to see, you know, of course, the pressure was incredible on, on Zinedine Zidane, but where he's pushed to the limit and uh, he's, he's been known to be volatile, he's also been known to score and excel when it really matters the most. I mean, the first World Cup final he played, he scored two goals. In this World Cup final where he played, he also scored a goal. He's, you know, scored many goals in Champions League finals. So there's a, an interesting, there might be a relationship, uh, Sam, maybe you can say something about this, about, you know, a, a personality that is capable of performing uh, at its very best. Uh, but also, you know, when you push yourselves to the limit of your capability, uh, you know, you're also more vulnerable to, 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 yeah, headbutt people. Sure. I mean, it's a very fine line, right? A lot of what we're celebrating in our elite athletes is the ability to, to, to make quick decisions, to act impulsively, perhaps, to have a certain level of aggression. Uh, adjectives like, you know, quicksilver and, and mercurial. I mean, these are positive descriptors of our elite athletes. They also aren't necessarily always great predictors of, of terrific decision making uh, in, in other contexts. And so it is this fine line between the controlled aggression you need in certain sports and the, maybe the cool headed rationality we're expecting to see people demonstrate in other contexts. So there is, I think, that give and take. Yeah, I think it's also uh, when it comes down to their media performances. Was it uh, Daryl Lynch who, who uh, uh, gave this uh, emotional speech after, uh, uh, after an NFL game? Um, you know, we, we expect NFL players to destroy their opponents right. uh, in one second. And then as soon as they come off the field, we expect them to be uh, extremely uh, well-spoken and well-mannered uh, uh, brand ambassadors. And that's a conflict that I always find. That's a tough transition, yeah. yeah. Mm. Sam, there is a question here on that point uh, that Thomas just made from Mara. She writes in that yelling at refs and umpires and other athletes is an energy leak. She puts that in quotes. She says a good question to ask is whether the athletes who repeatedly lose their cool believe it actually helps them or their team's performance. Did you see that at all? Uh, it's an interesting question because it could, uh, again, you get sort of competing hypotheses. Or if we're talking about 
you know, there are certainly times where coaches, where managers will go off on the refs or go off on a player with the idea being to elevate the team's energy level. And, and that's, a, that's a plausible hypothesis. The, the idea that, that yelling at a referee is somehow sort of a safe way to le leach out energy and then redirect your focus towards your goals in mind is, I, I think, a little bit more dubious. It's a little like the old argument to go up to your room and scream into your pillow and punch your bed and that'll make you less aggressive. But I'm not sure the research suggests that works that well in the long run. No, that's for sure. We're talking... I, I think it... yeah go ahead John. sorry yeah go ahead. No, I, I go think ahead. it's it's very true that um, coaches especially rarely players but coaches can use aggression at officials as a means even when they get expelled from the game as a means to send a very distinct message to the body of referees as a whole or to their, their team um, I was I certainly was in that position when Doc Rivers was my coach in Orlando and he saw that he thought I was not being given a fair shake by the referees. And one game, he, he just said, that's enough, and did enough to get a technical foul. And, and in that moment, he sent the message both to me that he had my back and was supporting me, and, and also to the referees that he, he, he saw that I wasn't getting a fair shake. And things did change. But for players, it's never sensible. It's a poor strategic move to irritate the people who are human, after all, who have... Uh, very subjective decisions to make, especially de it depends on the sport, but certainly in basketball and in football, often very subject, uh, subjective decisions to make in microseconds. To irritate them in, in any way, bias them against you as a person is just a foolish strategic move. Huh. Do you think that's going through the minds of, of athletes, um, Sam, as, as they're in, the, in, that, in that moment right there? Yeah, I don't think right there. I think, and I think John would probably agree, as we were discussing before. I'm not yeah. sure that kind of cold calculation is being done. Now, Doc Rivers, the coaches may be doing that a little bit. I need yeah. to do something to rile this team up. There, you know, this is the the 74th game in an 82 game season. We're lacking energy, but I think for the players, it's often getting caught up in the heat of the moment. And as John suggests, not only is it perhaps a poor use of your own energy, but these are people who you're trying to be maybe sympathetic towards and appeal for their uh, better judgment. And I'm not sure screaming at them in public is going to do that. I want to show you a little clip. We're going back to, uh, 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 there's a sports company uh, in the UK, in the United States called ESPN. They did a campaign a few years ago that actually was the inspiration for Sam to write and co-author the book about your brain on sports. So have a look at one of the campaign uh, little clips and then I'll come back to you, Sam, to, to see how the book kind of came about. Sure. Checking in. Your name, please. Michael Jordan. Oh. Michael Jordan, 8 o'clock. Oh. That's me. Oh. Oh. Oh, man. How you doing? Really? Let's go. Oh, poor Michael Jordan. The poor, poor Michael, Michael Jordan. Jordan. The, yeah. So the whole idea of the book was what, Sam? What did you want to draw in terms of the connection and the link? Because this has been an interesting conversation, but how does that help us outside of sport? Sure. Yeah, so this is a book. So I wrote this with John Wertheim, who's the executive editor at Sports Illustrated. What we wanted to do was to take this idea that that uh, there's a craziness to sport. There's a craziness to sports that's unique to that domain and, and maybe turn it on its head a little bit and suggest that a lot of what we talk about as being idiosyncratically, again, crazy or, 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 or loony behavior from fans, from players, from coaches, from front office, managers from, from referees for that matter, isn't really crazy, isn't that idiosyncratic, is, is really a offshoot of some of the, the, the decision making and other human tendencies that we exhibit in our day to day lives as parents, as business people and so forth. And so the book is really an attempt to uh, take the world of sports and to apply it to human nature more generally and say, what, what can we learn about what it means to be a, a person and a human based on this uh, seemingly unusual world of sports that maybe isn't all that unusual after all. You know, it's interesting, uh, Sam, people online are saying, that, that question on what we could learn, the answer actually comes a lot sooner than we might think. So this is a comment we got on Facebook from Judy, and I'll pass this over to you, John. Judy says, this is ingrained in us from childhood. Why do elementary schools have mascots? Children are rarely competing against others at that age. It's because it's designed to teach children to blindly follow. What do you make of that? I think I also have a question, follow-up question for Thomas, sorry. Um, 
related to that. Just in terms of so, Abba, hold tight for that passion. one. Abba, hold tight for that one. Okay. We'll do one question at a time. So, uh, Malika. Okay. okay. So, John, uh, answer that one, and you can go to Abba's. But you know, this idea of it being ingrained in us from the very beginning. There is there is very good uh, data in the UK, for example, that team sports originated uh, mostly. Uh, they were mostly organised around the Industrial Revolution and some of the uh, the sports themselves may not have originated there, but team sports as a uh, as a something that villages and towns really took part in, and boys were pushed pushed into in in almost uh, huge numbers. Uh, was done by mill owners and uh, was done by uh, people who owned uh, mines because they wanted to do exactly what your your commenter suggested. They wanted to teach boys how to behave as part of a team, as operate operate under a, a leader who would tell them exactly what to do and to follow instructions. It's I, I mean I I think there is some merit to that, um, but I don't know I don't know if the mascots in elementary school are, are quite so sinister as all that. Oh. I think. People have an evolutionary. Um, people have an evolutionary tendency to want to follow something strong and meaningful. It's it's that's that's from the very beginning of time when we were wearing loincloths. So frankly. would that be would that would that be like let, would that be Leicester City then, who's top of the Premier League right now? Would that be something following something strong and meaningful? Exactly. Well, look at the number of people who are now magically Leicester City fans. Um, exactly. Who didn't hear of yes. it before. People do yeah. enjoy following a rising star. Yeah. Uh, and there is an evolutionary kind of prerogative to that, sure. where we follow things that we see on the ascendancy and depart from things that we see on the on the fall. Let's squeeze in Abba's question. Just go for your question again, Abba. Sure. I apologize. Um, it was for Thomas specifically, and I wanted to ask. You know, you can get sports sports fans to exhibit a lot more behaviors based on the marketing that you do just because it's such a passion brand. So I wanted to know, you know, how, what you make of that and, and the kinds of cool things that you feel as a sports marketer that you're uniquely positioned to be able to get people to do beyond, you know, other brands and other marketers. Well, I would say fan loyalty is very different from brand loyalty. When you invest in a particular brand and they are not delivering the value, or the quality that you would expect from the brand that you invest in, you buy a competing product. And if you look at fan loyalty, uh, one very interesting stat that I actually got from Sam's podcast was uh, the fact that 4% of uh, people would uh, be likely to change their religious beliefs, but only 2% uh, would be likely to change their uh, club affiliation. Ooh. So. Fan loyalty actually exceeds uh, religious loyalty in that sense, and you know it, it almost has a spiritual dimension. You know where you are um, mm -hmm. committed to a team, and it's like heartbreak on training wheels. Uh, you know, it's it's you learn how to how to uh, to live is to suffer. You know, to throw out another yeah. philosophical. Uh, That's right. Yeah, sports uh, sports is religion. I mean, even even down to the idea of, of the rituals that go into it. You think about religion. You think about rituals. You think about sports fans. Their rituals. What you know, whether it's the chanting at a certain uh, that a certain soccer team does, a certain football team does in support of its club, or or the the other things that go on at certain stadiums. You see things that are rituals that bond fans together, that that cement their loyalty to, uh, as Thomas is suggesting, to this team in a way that is nearly religious in its nature. Sam, let me yeah, just ask you one more thing. We've got about a minute. Uh, we've got about sorry, a minute left, uh, Thomas, and we'll come back and, and have a more fulsome conversation when we get online again. But um, Sam, your book is Your Brain on Sports. What actually happens to our brain? when we're watching it, it, sport. Yeah, so so when we're watching sports, I mean, if we take just one example of what it's like to see the team we're rooting for win, we, we see activation in regions of the brain, the same regions of the brain that are activated when other pleasure, pleasurable activities are engaged in. Again, these pleasure centers of the brain get more blood flow when we see our favorite team uh. win. Now, interestingly, the same centers of the brain are activated when we see the arch rivals lose. And Ooh. so there's something about sports that brings out this need to affiliate, but also the schadenfreude of, of celebrating the, the, the misfortune of the teams we're rooting against. And so <laughs> you see sort of this pain pleasure uh, center activated the way you would in other activities. Sam Summers, John Amici, Thomas Van Scheig, Abba Galavalli. We are taking you to our online show. Hopefully you can join us as well at stream.outzero.com. Thanks for watching, everybody. Take care.
Hello again, this is the Streams Online Post Show. We're talking about the behaviour of fans and the behaviour of athletes in the world of sport and how that may well affect our behaviour in everyday life as well, or the links that we can draw. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see how our online community are having this conversation. Well, they're talking about that last question you just asked Sam about mm -hmm. the brain. So Sam, I want to give you a video comment. This is from Brad and he wants to talk about how we can maybe apply this to some real life situations. So have a listen. Hey guys, I just read your chapter, Acting on Impulse. And in it, you highlight a few studies that seem to demonstrate that competitive arousal seems to bypass the area of the brain that's designated for higher level of thought and judgment. My question is, would lower levels of blood flow to this area of the brain be a greater indication that a player is going to lose his cool in the heat of the moment? And how likely is it that teams can measure this in potential players in the future? Is it measurable? That's a fascinating question, right? Because you know the teams are looking for any possible competitive advantage that they can come up with. And if you could somehow identify who's going to react in certain ways to certain circumstances, uh, that, that would be a fascinating thing that would give teams this, this kind of advantage. And I guess I'll say I'm a little dubious that that's going to be at an individual difference level that reliable. Because, again, you do need a certain level of... of, of, of Aggressiveness maybe isn't the right word, but of arousal certainly you want players whose whose heart get ra who get, get racing, who get uh, you know caught up in the heat of the moment, but also ones who are able to maintain some modicum of cool during the the, the, the crunch time of a game. And so I, I think you are going to see teams start to do this, start to try to get this kind of feedback on the players they're drafting, the players they have. Uh, I think we're not yet at a stage where individual difference measures of people's brains in, in response to stimuli are giving us that much predictive validity for, for again, anticipating how they're going to act in certain circumstances. John? There, there is no doubt that teams are interested in this kind of difference at this point already. The problem is that, that sports are light years away from really understanding this. Um, you know, all it would take is a cursory look at the questions that coaches ask players at the NFL Combines, for example, <laughs> <clears throat> to tell you that they they have no real clue about the psychology of of young people about the psych of the impact of of their words and uh, really the way their brains work. Can you give us a so little sure example, uh, John, for those of us who've never been to the combines? Can you give us a little example well, of why that? I, this is the problem. I was thinking about it earlier, and yeah. I just don't know which ones of the examples I can actually use on air because some of the <laughs> questions are so. We're online. That Feel free so to absurd. say anything you want to. <laughs> So uh, the questions have included looking at a man with dreadlocks and saying, so you've got dreadlocks, you must smoke pot. Uh, other, questions, other questions include, um, if you could kill somebody and get away with it, would you do it? What? If you were going to kill somebody, would you use a knife or a gun? What? These are the kind of questions they use, Ooh. apparently to elicit some kind of uh, understanding as to whether this player can keep their calm or cool or not. And I, it, you can tell by these questions how totally unsophisticated it is. Wow. But I think eventually they're going to cotton on to the idea that understanding the temperament of people more clearly is useful. But as Sam already said, being able to walk the fine line of being absolutely vicious at the same time as being totally in control is a rare thing indeed. And yeah. you do see it in some people. You see a cold steel in their eyes Who, and you that? know that they who's step that, on your neck. Well, mm. many of the players that you would think of, so yeah. uh, Carl Malone in basketball, uh, even players like Cristiano Ronaldo, you see, at, and Messi, you see at times a point where, although it doesn't, their vicious streak may not translate into actual physical violence, it translates into a total empathy dearth for their opponent. They will want to not just beat them, but humiliate them, mm. want to make it so that the player coming up against them feels absolutely humiliated and never wants to face that again. I even when they do it with a smile on their face. John, do you know, I have a feeling that that's the kind of player that you were. I, w yes, I am somewhat Teutonic. <laughs> and I would, very much, <laughs> I would very much enjoy decimating a player and then move, moving away with my face absolutely neutral. I think it's <laughs> uh, Sam and John, yeah, maybe yeah, I, go I, on, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. This, this has to do with uh, verbal identity and, and, and some kind of a, a big data kind of research where I read uh, an article about uh, the words that athletes use and the, um, the measurements that are being done on those, on those interviews uh, allowing a big data scientists to actually make predictions about their capability to actually perform well. 
Uh, Sam, I see you nodding your head. Is, it, is there something you think I'd elaborate on that topic? I, I, it's an interesting idea. And, and, you know, there is now in the era of big data, there's sort of no shortage to the kinds of sources of data that we might we might look to. Uh, some of that also, you know, I think of the some of the famous athletes here in the United States who at this point have evolved into pretty rote uh, and cliched and uninformative press conferences. And so some of it has to do with how how uh, outspoken and, and, and freely speaking these athletes are during these press conferences. We do seem to have reached, uh, you know, Derek Jeter, the famous Yankee baseball player, was sort of the epitome of this, where he was friendly and accessible, but he never really said anything. And so if you're not really saying anything, who knows what you're actually getting from these conversations. But uh, I think you'll see, absolutely, I think you'll see teams uh, mining any sorts of data they can get to try to predict player performance. It's to their competitive advantage to identify those kinds of uh, predictions of uh, data sources. What's really yeah, interesting is, press. is uh, yeah. let, me, let me just uh, bring in Abba, Thomas, just for a moment. Abba, you were already yeah. reading Sam's book before we even invited you to be on the show, so it's an amazing coincidence. Is there something that you wanted to ask yeah. him before we wrap up the show? Um, sure. I, one thing I wanted to ask was, um, in terms of the rivalry that we were talking about, you know, in this day and age, sort of we say we we say our team wins but if our team loses we say they lost right. so knowing that juxtaposition at the same time at the same time you know there's superstitions that we hold where as fans if we don't do that certain thing that we always do and our team loses we still end up blaming ourselves so how does that sort of do, those two theories how do they sort of play with one another Right. I mean, there is an ego protective component to well, much of how we navigate the social world, and we are more likely to speak in first person and say we and I when it's when it's the team is winning as opposed to when they're losing. But as some of our uh, viewers and their comments indicate, you know, and as that data point that what two percent of us would consider changing our sports team affiliation and no more than that, we we get locked in, and and there's even something almost. I don't want to say addictive, it's the wrong word, but there's something quite alluring even about rooting for a losing team. When you pour that much blood and sweat and tears and effort into something, you inflate the value of that end product at the end of the day because otherwise why would I have spent all my time and all my energy on this unless it was really that important to me? It's the reason why initiations mm -hmm. are actually powerful in groups. And so even rooting for a losing team is quite the powerful experience and, and can become part of your identity in this really interesting way. I, am I think going the phenomenon is also described in a thing. Either you work, you bask in reflective glory, or you cough and you cut off reflective failure. And I think the Big Bang uh, right. Theory, the comedy show, made a, a nice joke about that. It's like uh, watching Star Wars and like saying we defeated the evil empire. You know, that's almost uh, mm -hmm. the, the same kind of phenomenon. Uh, um, Sam, what's been the reaction to your book so far? Uh, it's been a lot of fun. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think we wrote this for sports fans, yes, but also for. The businesswoman and businessman out there who who wants to uh, think about how to manage her her employees better, the the parent who's coaching in youth sports, uh, for anyone who's again tangentially related to the world of sports, it's not just a book for sports fans. It's it's been a lot of fun. It's opened a lot of uh, doors to interesting conversations with different people like we did here today. See, John, you kind of turned the expertise that you you learned as when you were a player into kind of your professional expertise. Now, what do you think the biggest takeaway for you is? from your playing career into now how you're funneling it now as it just happens to be those were the elements and qualities in your personality already no i mean i i i've always been interested in psychology from a very young age i don't know if i ever leveraged it in the way that i should while i played uh -huh. I, I lament the fact that i didn't use it well enough <laughs> but it's there are things from sports that are useful lessons so um, one of the things that I take forward now as an organizational psychologist is the idea that people use the word team and group uh, as a synonym. They often, if there's an assembly of people in any organization, they assume that that's a team if they call it a team. And one of the things I learned playing professional sports and college sports is that a team is a purposeful thing. It happens because you make it happen. Groups are accidental. Um, and, and when you play with a team, there is something qualitatively different about it. Uh -huh. And I think to watch it, there is something qualitatively better about watching a, t uh, a group of high, uh, high power, high professional people as a team as opposed to a group. I really enjoy spending time with you today. We could talk about this for hours and hours and hours, but we're not going to. Malika, <laughs> what's the final thought you have from our online community? Oh, I'll leave us with a story because we were just talking about people who use the pronouns. Uh, they use we, they use I when they talk about their team. So this is one from Alec who says, the last time my Atlanta Hawks won an NBA championship, that's the National Basketball Association here in the United States, it was prior to Alan Shepard going into space. And that 
he notes, was in 1958. <laughs> but he says he still loves them because of hometown pride. That Aww. and the fact that they were the first professional team I ever really seriously followed. And the last time England won the World Cup was the year I was born. So that's a really long, long time ago. <laughs> but there's always the next World Cup. Okay, Sam and John and Thomas and Abba, it's been such a pleasure having you on today. Really enjoyed your company. Take care.